111,000 tests uh, in the 24 hours to 8 p.m. But regrettably, we also had a quite a large increase in the number of cases overnight. So 239 cases of community transmission. Around at least 70 of those were infectious in the community. And based on those numbers, we can only assume that things are likely to get worse before they get better, given the quantum of people infectious in the community. Can we stress again, as we have uh, in the last weeks, most of these transmissions are occurring amongst households and in workplaces, but also in health settings. If you're going to a pharmacist or a GP, make sure you don't have symptoms. Make sure uh, that you're asking for medical help from home if you need uh, to obtain any medical help whilst you have symptoms. We cannot continue to see the transmissions increase in these settings. Uh, therefore, um, the New South Wales Government, on advice from the police, has taken extra measures, also based on the health advice, in relation to compliance, in relation to making sure that everybody across the state, but in particular in those local government areas of concern, are doing the right thing. For that reason, uh, if you live within those eight local government areas, and I just want to make this point also, depending on the health advice, there could be more local government areas that come into those areas of concern, or there could be those that come out, depending on how the case numbers are going. But if you're living in a local government area of concern, and at the moment there are eight of them, uh, you need to make sure you wear a mask now at all times. So if you step foot outside your household, you need to wear a mask at all times. It doesn't matter where it is. We're receiving uh, and seeing too much evidence of people who aren't wearing masks when they need to, or if they are uh, outdoors, they're coming into contact with other people and not having a mask. So if you live in a local government area of concern, you must wear a mask when you set foot outside of your house. Uh, secondly, if you live in a local government area of concern from midnight tomorrow, you can only move within a five kilometre radius of your home. So it doesn't matter what the reason is. Uh, unless there are exceptional circumstances, you have to make sure you do not move within a five kilometre radius of your home. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's for shopping. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, for other re exercising that you're allowed to leave the house from. Uh, you can't move beyond a five kilometre radius and that includes singles bubbles. If you want to have a singles bubble in a local government area of concern, uh, you cannot have anybody move or you can't move within five kilometres of where you live. In relation to compliance, uh, we're also increasing penalties for people not wearing masks when they have to. Obviously in those local government areas of concern, from tomorrow midnight you have to make sure you wear a mask every time you set foot outside your house. Uh, and, but statewide, uh, it's pretty clear when you need to wear a mask, and if you don't, uh, you will be penalised. And the penalties will go up from $200 to $500 to allow that extra level of compliance and that extra la layer of deterrence. Uh, police will also, uh, from tomorrow, be given the power to close a public premise, a work site, a workplace, a business, if those uh, entities continue to flout the public health orders. We're noticing too much of a lack of compliance uh, from businesses or from premises. Uh, if that's the case, police will be given and are given the power to close down those premises. Uh, Commissioner Fuller, who is with us today, will talk about the increasing police presence and our increased focus on compliance. Uh, we appreciate it's a difficult time for so many people, for everybody in our state, but we also appreciate it only takes a handful of people or a very small percentage to do the wrong thing to cause a setback for all of us. And we can't afford setbacks. If we want to get out of this lockdown as soon as we can, we can't afford setbacks. So police will increase their compliance, will increase their presence on top of what's already occurring. And Commissioner Fuller knows that if he needs anything further, he can ask the government and he will receive it. And uh, Commissioner Fuller will be speaking about that in greater detail, as will Minister Elliott. Can I also stress uh, the message from Dr Chant and myself uh, and Minister Hazard, please come forward to get vaccinated. Uh, high rates of vaccination will be part of our road to freedom. And, uh, and whilst we're going through a very difficult time in New South Wales, uh, let's think about a period of time when potentially we live more free than any other state because our vaccination rates are higher. Please know that the vaccination rate gives us those freedoms to make decisions about how we live more freely moving forward. And I encourage everybody to follow the health advice, come forward and get vaccinated. We're making it easier for people to get vaccinated uh, through our health hubs, 
through pharmacies, uh, and also obviously through GPs. So please come forward and get vaccinated. That is part of our road to freedom and a critical part of dealing with the coronavirus, uh, the Delta strain in particular. As we know, the Delta strain is a game changer. It is so different to any other strain of the virus that we've seen. And not only does vaccination reduce you going into hospital, your chances of you going into hospital, but it also reduces how infectious you are and how much you convey the virus to others. And finally, can I just make this point? Please know that no matter what your circumstances, if you've experienced financial loss, financial hardship because of the lockdown that we have imposed on you, please go to Services Australia for individual disaster payments. You only need to apply once and then every week that amount will go into your account automatically. So please do not suffer in silence. If you're experiencing job loss, reduction in hours, uh, please contact Services Australia to get those payments. You only need to apply once and it automatically goes into your account every week during a lockdown. Similarly, if you're a business and you've received or experienced a reduction in your turnover, please contact Service New South Wales to make sure you get those grants that you're eligible for. It doesn't matter the size of your business, small, medium or large. If you've been impacted by the lockdown, anywhere in New South Wales, please make sure you contact Service New South Wales. And I just wanna make those points because we appreciate as a government what we're asking all of you to do. These aren't easy decisions for us, but it's what's going to keep us safe and get us through this, this Delta strain. And I just ask everybody not to suffer in silence, not to suffer at home. Please make sure you contact either Services Australia for individual payments or Services New South Wales for business grants. I'll now ask Commissioner Fuller uh, to make his comments. Minister Elliott will make some comments and then obviously Dr Kerry Chant will provide a health update. Thank you. Thanks, Premier. Good morning, Ministers. Good morning, ladies and gents. As a result of feedback from New South Wales Police on the ground, and community complaints around non-compliance. I sought additional powers from the New South Wales Premier uh, this week and thank you to Premier and Cabinet Crisis for providing those powers. The powers particularly will focus on those people who are not doing the right thing. The power for me to close premises and public places will focus on the businesses who are doing the wrong thing. We know that with industry kicking off, such as building on Saturday, many will do the right thing. They will follow the health advice. They shouldn't be punished for the few who are doing the wrong thing. Thousands of additional police will be in and around the eight LGAs, Greater Metro Sydney, and still protecting rural New South Wales from COVID. We know that the numbers are too high today. We all want to come out of lockdown. These new powers, the additional police into these areas is about getting us out of lockdown sooner. So you can expect to see more police on the ground. You can expect to see more enforcement. We have been in this now for a number of weeks. There are a lot of people doing the right thing, but these orders will focus on those who continue to breach the health orders, who continue to keep us in lockdown. We want to be out of lockdown quicker. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, the New South Wales Government and the New South Wales Police detest the fact that we've had to increase these penalties and provide extra power to the police force. It is certainly not something that we want to do and it is in fact something that we cannot wait to shred. Uh, these powers, these health orders, these restrictions are something that the Government cannot get rid of quick enough. But it's quite clear from the overwhelming number of people that are doing the right thing that same overwhelming number of people have had a gutful of their fellow, 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 fellow residents doing the wrong thing. And that's evident by the fact that we are now getting tens of thousands of people reporting breaches through Crime Stoppers. And my appeal to the people of New South Wales is to make sure you continue providing that information. Because it's only through that information that the police are going to be able to ensure compliance and it's only through that information that we're going to be able to get these figures down. I know um, that uh, some of the Crime Stoppers reports have been slow in being taken. Please keep trying. Uh, get online, get onto the portal, ring the Crime Stoppers line. It is very, very important that that information continues to come through because the strike force is working 24-7 to make sure that uh, uh, any, uh, any breaches are certainly investigated, if not fined. 
We want to see a weekend where no fines are issued. We want to see a weekend when everybody's doing the right thing uh, so that in the next two or three weeks the government can start to see these restrictions eased. Uh, it is very, very important for the community to be rest assured that this short-term pain has a long-term gain. We want to make sure that uh, uh, everybody complies with the restrictions knowing full well that it is the intent of the police, it is the intent of the, governor, of the government and certainly the intent of the Commissioner and I to get rid of these restrictions, get rid of these fines as quickly as we had to introduce them. There were 240 cases of COVID reported in New South Wales and of these, 239 were locally acquired and one was overseas acquired. It was pleasing to see that testing volume, 110,962. But, you know, disturbingly, we're still seeing these case numbers rise and we're still seeing too many people infectious in the community. Sadly, a woman, um, we've had two COVID-related deaths, and a woman in her 90s from southwestern Sydney died yesterday morning at Liverpool Hospital, and she was not vaccinated and was a household contact of a confirmed case. Uh, she's not linked to the Liverpool Hospital cluster. And there was a gentleman in his 80s from southwestern Sydney who died yesterday afternoon at Royal North Shore. And again, he was not vaccinated and was a household contact of a confirmed case. Can I just extend my sincere sympathies to the families? Um, but I think these deaths do highlight a key issue. At this level of cases, we are going to continue to see further deaths. And sadly, too many elderly people in our community are not protected. When I reviewed the Commonwealth vaccination data, which is readily available online, sadly, 25% of people over 70 are still yet to receive their first dose. I cannot urge you as members of the community to reach out and support your elderly family members and friends to get vaccinated. The vaccine does not work immediately in providing protection, but even one vaccine can reduce your risk of hospitalisation and death, and it can also prevent onward transmission. But it is critical that elderly people get vaccinated. I think one of the interesting things for people to reflect on is the challenges we'd had with aged care early on um, in the first um, wave. And what we've seen is we've had a number of workers in aged cares, but the consequences have been much less severe because of the high rates of vaccination rates in those settings. So again, I don't think you need more evidence that vaccines will save lives and COVID will kill. So please get vaccinated. There are currently 182 COVID cases admitted to hospital, 54 people in intensive care and 22 whom require ventilation. And they're young. Many of the cases are young. We've got two in their teens, eight are in their 20s, four are in their 30s, and three are in their 40s. So it's not only an old person's disease. So everyone should discuss vaccination and get my message is get vaccinated. I'd also just like to raise the fact that um, we have lots more access points for vaccine. So we have pharmacies that are opening up across the state providing AstraZeneca vaccine. And we also have local initiatives. So I urge you to go to the website and find out about those. I'd just like to give a big call out for a couple. One is the Prairie Wood AstraZeneca Vaccination Clinic at the Prairie Wood Youth and Community Centre in Restful Road, Prairie Wood. It operates seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 4.30 and you can just walk in. So I challenge the community in that area, go and get vaccinated today. There's also a, a clinic being set up today on Thursday the 29th um, at the Allen Easy Community Centre, 1 Newport Street, Pemmelway. Um, but there are a variety of access points. So your GP, pharmacist, and also the health service are providing a number of, of clinics. I just wanted to alert you to one other um, issue that a staff member who works at Royal Prince Alfred's Hospital's emergency department tested positive to COVID 
and the staff member is fully vaccinated but was potentially infectious whilst at work on a number of days on July 24th, July 25th, July 26th and July 27th. And just to reiterate that the person didn't have any symptoms um, and they tested positive with a regular surveillance test. Um, now, obviously, all close contacts and casual contacts have been identified and contacted, and there's been no evidence of transmission to date to staff or patients, and the emergency department has been thoroughly cleaned and there's no disruption to patient care. We, we shouldn't be in lockdown to protect these at-risk people. The reason we are in lockdown is that COVID is a severe disease for any age group. And with the Delta strain, we cannot live with the Delta strain with the current level of vaccination in our community. So my key message is please, if you, ha if you are over 70, if you're over 60, if you're really any age, you need to take up the opportunity. But I'm just drawing the point to the fact that the consequences for someone over 70 will inevitably be almost tragic. So please get vaccinated, uh, make an appointment. There are increasing access points. And I also call upon other family members to really support their elderly uh, family and friends um, to get vaccinated. And that. I mean, we require people to stay at home, but I can't see a better reason to leave the house than to get vaccinated. Dr. Dr. Chan, Dr. Chan, sorry, um, half, half the cases today, Dr. Chan, uh, you can't link them, you don't know the source. How is that when we're in the middle of a lockdown and people's movements are meant to be so limited? So some of, the, some of the cases are still under investigation. You can imagine with 238 cases, it takes some detective work to find out the sources. But clearly, under a stay-at-home order, you've got very limited opportunities for mixing. So um, the, if you leave your house and act in a way that everyone around you has COVID, we have mask wearing, we have requirements um, to be as brief as possible when you're shopping, then your opportunity for interaction with others is really reduced. So that is why we're really asking people to follow those stay-at-home orders. Don't spend more time than you need getting those essential items. And please, if there is a small shop and there's people inside, wait outside. Being outside is much, much safer. So obviously that a number of the cases may be linked to workplaces or other household interactions. And again, um, I can't stress this enough. I understand the need for connectivity. Um, this has been a very challenging 18 month period. Brilliant. I can't deny that. We do actually need, but for, for, to battle COVID, to um, get on top of this, we do need families and households to stay in the household Premier. group, not the broader. Premier, 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 Premier. Dr. Chan just said that being outside is much safer. Uh, you've done, you've made masks mandatory outside the home for all of these people and eight LGAs. Is this more of a symbolic decision, something that you've previously yeah. railed against? And also, can you clarify these rules for the eight LGAs apply to people who live outside the LGAs but are going into the LGAs for work every yeah. day? Uh, obviously, the reason, part of the reason why we're mandating mask wearing for people living in those eight local government areas, and I want to stress the number of those local government areas might increase or decrease depending on what the virus is doing and where the movements are. But part of the reason is it makes it easier for police to enforce uh, because it's really important for us to focus on compliance. We've had thousands of police out in force already working with the community and that will continue, but there will be an extra emphasis on compliance. Uh, police were providing updates that anecdotally people were using the excuse of exercising for 10 kilometres or exercise or or uh, doing other activity within 10 kilometres uh, really to get around or to breach the health orders. And that can't continue in those communities where the virus is circulating the rate at which it is. So part of the reason is to, firstly, by reducing the radius to five kilometres within those areas of concern, uh, gives police greater ability to uh, 
do their job, but also the mask enforcement it has a health benefit in that if you can casually come into contact with someone else and you're not wearing a mask, obviously that increases transferability given an area has a lot of the virus, but it also provides opportunity for police to ensure that everybody is wearing a mask when they're in and around other people. Premier, with these numbers today, with these numbers today, with these numbers today, sorry, I'm just trying to get with these numbers today, will you admit that your strategy has failed, that you have failed? Sorry, I'll just, if I can just finish. And you said the settings were right, that's not true. And National Cabinet is going to decide it was a short, sharp, hard lockdown was the way. Can you see now that you've made, made a mistake there and the strategy is failing? And this death of a thousand cuts, a little bit of restrictions every day just isn't working. You have to come down hard. Uh, well, we have harsher restrictions in place than any other state has ever had. And even if you look at mobility data, which we have access to, the vast majority of our citizens are actually doing the right thing. If you compare our mobility data to when Melbourne was in lockdown, the vast majority of our citizens are doing the right thing. But as we know, the Delta strain is a complete game changer and it is so contagious. And we also know uh, that it only takes, it only takes a very small number of people to do the wrong thing to cause ripple effects, which can cause a setback. So you haven't and, and of course, all governments uh, are, are making their way through the Delta strain around the world. There is no perfect way to deal with a pandemic and we've been far from perfect. And I would have made that comment 18 months ago. We've been far from perfect. But if you look at other places around the world and the way the Delta strain has taken over communities, even when vaccination rates have been much higher than ours, we can take some comfort in the fact that today we haven't had thousands and thousands of cases, thousands of people in hospital and many more deaths. And that's what these lockdowns are about. It's about preventing that severe illness. It's about preventing death and keeping the community safe. And once our vaccination rates go up, uh, obviously then we can consider uh, the way forward. But it's really important for us to acknowledge that had we not done what we'd done uh, in the last five weeks, the situation would have been far worse. And I'm never going to suggest we get everything right. I don't think any government around the world can say they get everything right because there's no rule book. And I'm the first one to admit at every stage of the process in the last 18 months, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, it'd be wonderful to know what the alternative course is, but we will never know that. But what I do know is that compared to other places in the world, as difficult as it is now, uh, we've kept thousands of people safe and thousands of people healthy, which otherwise would have succumbed. And as Dr Chant, Minister Hazard and myself and everybody in the team says every day, the vaccines are working. The vaccines work. Touch wood, I'm yet to be advised of anybody in intensive care who's had both doses of the vaccine. Premier. And Premier. based on and based on that, we really need to we really need people. It's a call to arms. Please come forward and get vaccinated, especially if you have older vulnerable people in your community, because with the numbers the way they are, and as I said, I always say it like it is. With the number of infectious people in the last few days in the community, it's likely case numbers will continue to rise before they start coming down. And that also means more deaths. Protect your loved ones. Don't take the virus home. Don't do the wrong thing. And please come forward and vaccinate. Premier, you said that we don't know where the virus is going. It's a game changer. It's so contagious. All of these messages every day. So why not bring in these stricter rules around masks and distance? Why not bring them in for all of Greater Sydney to try and get ahead of possible spread so that we're not playing catch up? Well, obviously, some of the local government areas which um, Dr Chant advised us to, to include were part of a precautionary basis. So the case numbers in some of those local government areas aren't as high as other areas. So the government's already taking precautionary uh, uh, advice, uh, sorry, precautionary action to make sure that we stay ahead of where the spread might go. But it's also important for us to note that with compliance, we need to focus on those communities where the virus is particularly circulating. And that is really important. It's finding the right balance with keeping society going, encouraging positive mental health and physical health at this stage, but also focusing our compliance efforts where we know the major problems are. Well, and that is really important. The, the, for instance, the compulsory mask wearing outside and the five kilometre radius elsewhere. I mean, people can still exercise with that. They, can, they just need to wear a mask well, that, outside. That, all of that is based on the health advice. And if the, if the health advice changes to that effect, of course, we'll consider that. And we always do. But it's also important to note 
that this stage of the virus, we, we really need to focus on compliance. Uh, the police commissioner asked the government for extra powers and extra certainty. So a lot of the measures we've talked about today are really first and foremost a compliance issue. It allows police to get on top of people doing the wrong thing. Uh, and obviously what the government always considers is the health advice we receive, but also from a compliance perspective, police give us great advice on how they can make sure everybody's doing the right thing. So some of the announcements we've made today are actually a result of compliance issues rather than first and foremost health issues. These rules, these, rules, these rules apply to people who work inside these LGAs every day and then go home uh, to a different LGA. Can you clarify yes. that? And also, you say that uh, these rules are about compliance, making it easier for police to enforce the rules. Doesn't that show that the rules that you had in place before now were deficient, as was the public health order put in place to enforce those rules? Can I say part of the response to Delta means you have to be flexible and you have to adjust according to where the challenges are. So uh, obviously over the course of the last few weeks, it's been apparent to us where the virus is circulating, where the problem areas are, and then obviously how we respond to that. So we should always be open to being adaptable and flexible according to what the virus is doing and according to where the virus is circulating. So for example, uh, thank you to people who live within the Fairfield local government area. Relative to other local government areas, that area is doing better. So we've adjusted surveillance testing in that community and transferred it to Canterbury Bankstown. So we need to be flexible and adaptable. We need to be able to respond to the health advice and Dr Chan's advice might change overnight and we need to respond to that. But similarly, uh, compliance rests with the New South Wales Police Force and if the Police Commissioner says to the government he needs extra powers to be able to enforce some of the health orders, well we will do that. It's important for us to know that our need to be flexible means that we can respond as quickly as we can. We have learnings almost every day and a good government makes sure that they're listening to the experts and responding accordingly. And I want to thank, and I want to thank the community uh, for uh, responding to the health orders that we put in place. When we were first advised this year of the virulence of the Delta strain, when, we, when did you receive that advice? Uh, I can't give you the exact date, but obviously we know uh, that the Delta strain is far more virulent than any other uh, virus strain. But long before the outbreak? Long before the outbreak? I'll come back. Extra powers for work sites, but we, we keep getting told households the big problem. Are you going to be going suburb to suburb, street to street, door to door, knocking on these and actively looking for people who are in the wrong house and finding them on the spot? Yeah, look, absolutely. Overnight we conducted hundreds of checks, particularly of those who were close contacts or who have the virus. Thankfully, everyone was home as they were supposed to be on health advice. We'll continue to do that. We know home to home transmission is a huge issue for us. We know that people are bringing it home from work sites that aren't complying with health orders. So if you think about the powers that I've asked for, it will take it to those businesses that are breaching the health orders and it will take it back to the homes that are continuing to breach the health orders that are putting us into an extended lockdown. What about yeah, yeah, to Liz's question, Sorry. random door to door checks, not just close contacts, people in these LGAs, people where you think uh, people in areas where you think the virus is spreading in households because people are doing the wrong thing? So, so not random, but certainly targeted from complaints through Crime Stoppers. Uh, we're getting a number of complaints and the community have spoken as well. We will be patrolling the streets and we do have the right to seek information from people in terms of where their residence is so we can check that against the five kilometres or the ten kilometres outside of the eight LGAs of interest. Sorry, Liz. Oh, I was just asking that about close contacts. So, but anyway, it, uh, how have you gone? <laughs> how have you gone with the community? Because obviously, last March you were quite front and centre in the managing of the outbreak, whereas the premier has held off, uh, I guess, doing this sort of police compliance crackdown. What steps have you been taking to this point, and why have we got to this point where you're back again? Well, look, from the police perspective, is of course we have been out for 18 months enforcing the health orders. Obviously, pre-Delta, uh, infection rates were so low that, that, that the need for police was certainly removed. From an emergency management perspective, we've been on this journey the whole way, but we are seeing non-compliance at a level that's impacting on the virus and it's impacting on Sydney coming out of, or New South Wales coming out of lockdown. Have you considered the curfews, the bringing in? 
sorry, could I have one more for the police commissioner? Curfews, bringing in the army or the ring of steel, are any of those off the table at this point? Um, nothing is off the table between the conversation between the Premier and myself. We are not stretched at the moment, but clearly if there was an LGA expansion, I would absolutely have the confidence in expanding the Australian Defence Force in New South Wales. To be clear, they are working with us now in hotel quarantine. They are working in our police operations centre. Some 40,000 shifts in hotel quarantine alone assisting with New South Wales. So if we had to use them, absolutely I would call out. How are you planning this time around then compared to last lockdown? How much worse is compliance? I think the challenge is that the Delta variant is probably exposing some of the non-compliance where the previous uh, viruses hadn't. So uh, it is so contagious that going into families has been a real challenge and big families in those uh, eight LGAs. So I, I think the Premier has spoken so clearly and about the dangers of bringing it into your home and, and I just think people have underestimated the danger of the Delta variants and that has caused the numbers to be unacceptable and we all want to be out of lockdown and, and you know from my perspective I've offered the Premier some opportunities for police to assist with further compliance and those powers have been granted. Can I just ask you about... Can I ask you about... Sorry. The rules are, um, here, contained here, apply for people who live outside but work inside the LGAs of concern? As in which one? Sorry, can you be... Masks good? outdoors all the time, five kilometre radius. Yes, if you go into the... those yeah, absolutely. back if you, home with them? If you go into the eight LGAs as an expectation, you wear a mask, and what's the reason? Because we know the virus in those LGAs is a problem for us. How big a problem have you got with, yeah, amongst the new cases, being people who are not isolating but they're supposed to be isolating? The issues um, that we want to reinforce with the community is coming forward for testing quickly. So we're still finding that people are delaying getting a test and that means that by the time we find them, everyone in the household's um, positive and then also it means that unknowingly everyone's actually been out infectious in the community. We've got to break this cycle. The other message I'd like to say is I just urge all shopkeepers, um, pharmacists, we're working with pharmacies, um, to make sure that you've got processes to really minimise the number of people in your shop. We have um, instituted um, the one per four square metres, but what I'm actually asking you to do is keep those numbers in your shop to an absolute minimum. We do know the Delta strain is more transmissible, so if someone's in a small enclosed space, notwithstanding you're wearing masks. Can I also just um, do a call out for correct mask wearing? Um, the amount of noses, um, um, chins that I've managed to see with masks. And so um, it is important that people wear and fit masks appropriately to provide that protection. And also it is, in, it is critically important that people change the masks as well. So just masks are, are um, one line of defence, but again, it, as we've said, you know, don't go out with symptoms, wear a mask, be as brief as you can. Um, don't go into crowded spaces. If there's a few people inside waiting, just wait outside. Being outdoors is much safer. Knowingly breaching that health order and then testing positive. So we are not really aware, just to let you know, we've been working hand in glove with police and any issues around when we can't find someone, um, any issues of non-compliance. There's probably been a handful of cases, literally. And can I just say, under the Public Health Act, we have quite significant powers. And what we do is um, a, an order, and that is provided to police. And can I just thank the police force for their cooperation? They have assisted us on a number of occasions. It's a small, but a, a not in, you know, we, we need to be, re realistic that it's a small number of people but the actions of those small number of people have incredible consequences and I just want to thank the police for pr reacting promptly when health raises those concerns. Sorry, if cases are under 19, this is a very important point I think, uh, is it 25% that are, that are under the age of 19 that are being diagnosed with COVID um, at the moment? So yes, there are a large, I, I would have to check the number in relation to under 19, but certainly I'm from memory this morning about six, it changes around each day, but certainly a significant proportion, well over 50% were under 40 and the age profile we're seeing. Now we have to also remember that the communities of South Western and Western Sydney are also particularly young 
Um, but we do know that people are going to workplaces and it is, again, a call out to South Western Sydney and Western Sydney. They are the people that are keeping the city going. They have a lot of essential work that they undertake and therefore they're more mobile. And that's why it's really important that we break this nexus. And as I said, following the health orders will help us, but also I'm urging everyone to get vaccinated. That will also give us an edge and we're going to need that over the Delta strain. Well, Premier, Premier. 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 Um, we are aware of someone who is um, in Armidale. That person is no longer infectious. Um, we have, uh, and we are also following up a contact um, that was associated, a close contact that is also residing in Armidale, who had previously test negative, but we're just testing them again. Um, we will be repeating that sewage. So at the moment, we have some plausible pers um, source for that um, positive detection in Armadale, um, but we just need to be very sure because um, that person was residing there um, for a little period of time and it hasn't, hadn't previously detected. So for the abundance of caution, um, thank you for raising that. A big call out to the Armadale community. We do want you to come out and get tested. And as you've seen, we've seen some um, testing positive in the sewerage and then we respond. So thank you to the community. Vaccination is part of the fight against this, right? Um, do you foresee a situation if cases don't come down to zero that we are under significant lockdown measures until vaccination rates are sufficient to allow us to open up and what is that uh, rate that we need to do that? The, um, we, we assess the situation each day but I think what I've got to absolutely say is my commitment and that of my team and that of the police is to get the numbers down. We've got to see this turn around. Um, and if you do not have contact with anyone, you cannot transmit it. You, there is no possibility of transmitting it if you do not have contact. And even if you transmit it to your household, if your household hasn't been out, then you won't transmit it. So I think there is a, a fundamental responsibility on us all to take the lockdown incredibly seriously. There are a lot of um, things that have been put in place through the local emergency management system to support people with their welfare needs, and that's a big call out. Please do not in any way um, have any needs that are not being met. There are, please raise those, ring um, Service New South Wales, and help will be provided because we want to make sure that there are no barriers or people don't think they have to do anything other than ask for help at this time. Vaccination is the only way out of this, but what we're hearing from a lot of people in the community, particularly in the hotspot areas, is that they are not interested in getting a vaccination. So what are you gonna do to try and curb this hesitancy? And what is plan what is your plan B if you can't get them to change their minds? Well, what um, both Dr Chant and I have said consistently is that we need a dual approach. To get out of this lockdown, we obviously need the lockdown, the restrictions, but also higher rates of vaccination, which not only protect individuals, but reduce how contagious you are. And we do have strategies through community leaders and through people who are influenced by people they respect. Uh, and we know that in some communities, um, having a vaccine isn't something that comes naturally. And that's why we're really providing that important information. The evidence is there. If you want to protect those you love the most, not only do you need to respect the health orders, but also encourage vaccination. And the evidence is there. Again, there isn't anybody that we know of that has had both doses of a vaccine who's in intensive care. We know the vaccine works and you can't get any, you can't get any more, uh, you can't get any more uh, evidence than that's, sorry, I'll say, I'll say that again, it's important. There's no stronger evidence than the fact that two doses of the vaccine are keeping people out of hospital. They're also reducing how contagious you are. So if you want to protect yourself and your loved ones, get vaccinated. That's the strongest message we can send. Several of your federal Liberal MP colleagues, Dave Sharma for instance, have today, despite all this news, said that why are those areas in Sydney that have few cases still in lockdown? Is there any prospect for those areas with few cases coming out of 
lockdown or having some rules adjusted by August 26? Look, Finna, that will depend on the health advice. And we're looking very closely at areas like the Central Coast, like Shell Harbour and Wollongong and other places. But it's really important to note that when you have so many cases uh, lurking in the community, especially concentrated in those eight local government areas, but also when you have critical workers going into communities, you have to accept the risk is everywhere. And that's why all of us have to be vigilant no matter where we live. We can't cut corners no matter where we live. We have to abide by the health orders that, are under, that we uh, are under because that risk is there. And as, as Dr Chan has said repeatedly, it only takes one or two people doing the wrong thing to have this spread enormously. And so whilst your community may not have any cases today, you could very well do tomorrow. So whilst I appreciate people want to be let off if there are no cases in their community, that's the situation today. It may not be the situation tomorrow. So we need to stay vigilant and we need to make sure everybody is following the health orders. Everybody is subject in Greater Sydney, Blue Mountain, Central Coast, uh, Shell Harbour and Wollongong to the health orders. But uh, as the weeks go by, um, you know, if we get health advice that says some areas, uh, particularly those on the edge of greater metropolitan Sydney, are virus free and the risk is low, well, we can take those measures. And the Central West Orange is a good example where we're able to have a short period there and release that community. But if there are other examples where uh, the health advice suggests we can, we will. But I think everyone accepts that at this stage, given the case numbers are increasing, Greater Metropolitan Sydney strictly uh, is in a very, very serious situation with the Delta strain and uh, the health advice would not be recommending to me any time soon that those areas of greater metropolitan Sydney should be taken uh, out of those restrictions. Banks that are charging out-of-pocket costs to people to get the vaccine, some reports of people paying up to $250 for consultations and registrations, even in so South... So, the first part of the question. Clinics charging people out-of-pocket out of expenses for getting the vaccine. What's your message to them? People are saying that they've been paid, got forced to pay up to $250. Yeah, please know the vaccine is accessible and free. Anyone who's asking you to pay is not doing the right thing. We want to encourage as many people as possible to get vaccinated. Uh, we know that where we had supply issues, we're trying to be very strategic in how we get the vaccines out to as many people as possible, especially in those eight local government areas where the virus is circulating more than other parts of Sydney. So it's really important for us to get that message out. And the evidence is there, the vaccines work. And unfortunately, we are seeing deaths in many people who haven't had the vaccine. So we please urge, please follow Dr Chant. You don't have to listen to me. Listen to Dr Chant. She's the health expert. And she's strongly recommending that everybody come forward and get vaccinated. We've seen now some um, non-elective surgery be, be cancelled in, in big hospitals that are dealing with COVID. Are you confident that there's enough resources to, to deal with you know, these growing number of cases in hospitals? Well, well obviously, um, what we do is make sure we manage resources as best we can. But when you have an increasing number of people that need hospitalisation, it obviously does stretch your resources more than before. And that's why uh, the health system is large. As uh, Minister Hazard says, often we have over, I think, 140,000 employees in the system. It's a massive system. Uh, but it does mean that when you have more COVID patients, it does spread resources and spread the risk. And so the health department will make decisions based on that. But obviously that's why we want people to do the right thing and get vaccinated because it keeps people out of hospital. It protects our frontline health workers. It protects against spreading the virus in those health settings. So all of this has risk. And the best basic message is stay home unless you absolutely have to leave your house. And if you do have to leave the house, please follow the health orders depending on where you live. And more importantly, come forward and get vaccinated if you haven't had the vaccine. Now you can't get an AstraZeneca vaccine at a regional pharmacy unless you're aged 40. The 300 pharmacies that are coming on board next month, none of them are in the regions. Why is it blow after blow for vaccine access in the bush? Uh, please know that we're increasing. We have over 100 sites or points of access for uh, vaccines in the, in the regional and rural New South Wales. And we do thank uh, our regional communities that for a short period, there's about 40,000 Pfizer doses we'll need to uh, redirect. But that won't be a, a major setback at all, quite the opposite. Uh, we are increasing our contacts, points of contacts for people accessing the AstraZeneca. And in relation to pharmacists coming on board and what can happen uh, in relation to the rural and regional uh, access points, that's up to the health advice. If the health advice changes, we can obviously provide a greater access for more de de demographics. 
but that's also based on the risk of the virus. Just on the Oh, sorry. Just on construction in those eight LGAs, some businesses are saying they can do it safely, especially if people who live in the LGA are working on a site within the LGA. Why can't they have their own bubble? I'm sorry, but within those eight areas of uh, concern, those eight local government areas, any form of activity at this stage, any form of people coming together is a major risk to health. And for that reason, the New South Wales government has followed the health advice. We don't want any construction activity in those eight local government areas. I know that is a huge disappointment to many people, but we have a big job ahead of us in turning the curve, in turning the corner, and we're not there. Uh, we're not there. We need to see numbers go down, and that's why we need to be extra strict and, and base every decision on the health advice. I appreciate how disappointing it is for people, but if you don't change what you're doing, the numbers aren't going to change because the numbers will keep going up until we change things. And that's why reducing activity, reducing mobility, increasing compliance, these harsher measures are the harshest Australia has ever faced in a lockdown. Can I make that very clear? These are the harshest measures any place in Australia has ever faced. But we need to do that because we need to do that. But based on the health advice, our list of critical workers is the shortest that any state has had. Uh, the, the ways in which the reasons why you can leave your house is as strict as it is for anybody, uh, anywhere that Australia has seen. And that's what we need because the Delta strain is different to anything we've seen. And I appreciate, uh, whilst all of us are under stress and pressure with the lockdown, if you live in those eight local government areas, we're asking so much of you. But it's to keep you and your loved ones safe. It's to keep you and your loved ones healthy and out of hospital. And it's also to turn the curve, to reduce the numbers so all of us can get out of the lockdown. So for residents of these LGAs, they can't... Sorry, James, say that again. Residents in these LGAs of concern mm. can't leave, uh, can't travel more than five kilometres for a number of reasons, exercise, recreation, etc. But what about... Uh, for compassionate reasons. Someone can have someone into their house for compassionate reasons. Will you change the rule to prevent, uh, to, to, to limit the travel for well, compassionate the, the reasons basic, to the just five rule there, James, is aimed at obviously ensuring that people in those very challenged local government areas stay within a limited area. Um, and that's, that's the rule. That's what should happen. And I just stress again, it's not about uh, anything other than trying to keep them and their families safe. So, Minister, will you change, will, will you change the rule, Minister, uh, to yeah. make sure that... Your, sorry. Um, Minister, sorry, James. <laughs> um, there's been a number of commentators, one in particular who's called into question the need for a lockdown, called into question the expertise of the health <coughs> chief health officer. What do you say to... Um, people like Alan Jones who've made those comments publicly and keep repeating them. Look, um, there are a lot of people who uh, don't base their decisions in science um, or evidence. And all I'll say is uh, we're in a one in, 100, one in 100 year pandemic. The community more broadly need to understand the decisions are taken as best as possible on the basis of evidence and science to keep us safe. Um, more broadly, I'd say to those, we had a question from the lady, the journalist here before, about some people not, uh, not wanting to take vaccines. Well, my message to them is uh, you being extremely selfish. Uh, if you think you can not have a vaccine just because you don't want to have a vaccine, well, you should think about what you're doing to your family and to the community. And I would say even more than that, what a hide you have, what, what a ridiculous position is that when you're going to put health staff at risk and when you get sick, you're going to expect to come into hospital and get paid for by taxpayers. You know what? It's time for, for those who actually think that way to wake up, Minister, including, 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 including commentators who actually don't base their, uh, their commentary in any logic whatsoever. So. Minister, I'm here to Sorry, Lucy. There's a last question. On year, on year 12 students, given Sorry, the year 12 students, yeah. given the rise in numbers that we're still seeing, are you still comfortable with the with the plan to let you know 50,000 students move across the city? And have you started putting into place the logistics planning for daily testing, if that's the way it's going to be, and also the vaccinations? Look, the, the students who are doing their HSC, there's been a lot of work done by education to try and strike a balance, and everything is proportionate risk here. Um, students who worked for many many years to get to this point. 
trying to give them the opportunity to have that last few weeks of face-to-face -face teaching is uh, something that the government would like to do. I know the Education Minister is working very uh, astutely and, and uh, putting a lot of effort into working with uh, obviously teachers and schools across the independent, the Catholic and the government sector. Um, I think we can achieve it, but uh, we need people to be on the journey with us. I've seen some comments which are extremely negative from particular organisations that represent various people. I, my answer to them is, why are you trying to find reasons not to do these things instead of trying to find the ways to do it? Strike the balance. Don't be negative. We've got to work together. Thank you all. Thanks very much.